Renounce Your Atheism by Dr. Haytham Talat. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. One, what is atheism? Atheism is rejecting belief in any form of unseen divinity. The atheist denies the existence of a creator, of divine revelation, and of resurrection. 2. What is the proof that there is a creator? There are many proofs, but we will focus on two. The first is called Proof on the Basis of Existence, Dalil Alijad, and the second is called Proof on the basis of providence. Dalil al inea 3. What is meant by proof on the basis of existence? Everything is temporarily originated. It came into existence after it was non-existent, so it must have had an originator. This means we have 10 to the 124th proofs that a creator exists this number constitutes the overall number of molecules with their functional activities throughout the universe. By the way, this number is huge. It means 10 followed by 124 zeros. So, everything that originated and entered the sphere of existence is a proof that there is a creator. If you looked around you and pondered the universe with its incidental characteristic and its constant change, you will find that it is accidental and ever-changing rather than being perpetual or eternal. Hence, you are proclaiming that it is not self-subsisting, which will lead you to seek its originator, to finally realize that it has a creator. That is why many verses of the Quran bring the creations into focus. Allah says, what means? Say, look at whatever exists in heaven and on earth. But signs and warnings do not benefit the unbelievers. Translation of the Meaning of the Quran, Chapter 10, Verse 101 Allah also says, what means? Do they not ponder about their own selves? Allah has created the heavens and the earth and all that is between them for a purpose and for an appointed time. Yet many deny they will never meet with their Lord. Translation of the Meaning of the Quran, Chapter 30, Verse 8 He also says what means, Have they not looked into the realms of the heavens and the earth and all that Allah created and seen that the end of their time might be near? What will they believe in if they do not believe in this? Translation of the Meaning of the Quran, Chapter 7, Verse 185 So everything that has originated is in itself a direct proof that there is an originator. 4. What is meant by proof on the basis of providence? It means that everything ultimately in existence started from the quarks, which are the smallest subatomic particles ever allocated up to the galaxies, carries an extent of functional complexity. This means that each has a specific and specialized function, and a functional complexity necessarily means a grade above mere existence. Existence is a status, and the complexity within the originated thing is a grade above that status of mere existence. So, everything around you is designed in a special method, so as to carry on a special function. Hence, everything around you carries a functional complexity, and this complexity is a proof of origination, which means that it must have had an originator. An example of this is the lamp. This is a functional complexity. The electric lamp is made up of a coil, a lead wire that connects electricity to the coil, inert gas that protects the coil and does not affect it or the electricity, a glass bulb that prevents the entry of air or the exit of the inert gas which would otherwise burn the coil, and finally the base of the lamp which connects the lamp with the socket and ensures the passage of the electrical current. 
Here, the electric lamp demonstrates a system of complexity that cannot be dismissed or simplified, since it carries a rudimentary, rational indication to the mastery of the manufacturer. Then, the one who denies the masterful formation of the lamp, or assumes that it originated by chance, is the one required to fetch a proof to his assumption. The lampmaker knows pretty much well what electricity means, how it is conveyed, the benefit of the lamp, and the sensitivity of the coil. That's why the presence of the lamp is in itself a proof on the mastery of the maker. While having a diverse array of lamps can never be a proof that it is all just mere chance. Using this same rationalization, we can deduct that a creature with all this functional complexity, the human being, must have had an originator. The lamp is made up of four components, whereas the human being is made up of three billion components in each and every one of his cells. The human code is spelled out in three billion DNA letters, known as the human genome, and these letters reside within the nucleus of each of our molecules. So, if you look at the four components of the lamp and deduce that it must have had a maker, and you do not realize that you too must have had a maker, then the problem is in your way of thinking. Allah says, what means, were they created out of nothing, or are they their own creators? Translation of the Meaning of the Quran, Chapter 52, Verse 35 Look around and see the extent of complexity associated with virtually everything. There is actually nothing in this whole wide nature that is free from but a degree of complexity, according to the physicists. Allah says what means, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, in the alternation of night and day, in the ships that sail the ocean bearing cargoes beneficial to man, in the water which Allah sends down from the sky and with which he revives the earth after its death, scattering over it all kinds of animals, in the courses of the winds, and in the clouds pressed into service between earth and sky, there are indeed signs for people who use their reason. Translation of the Meaning of the Quran, Chapter 2, Verse 164 Only those who use their minds to ponder will take heed, but only the wise take heed. Translation of the Meaning of the Quran, Chapter 3, Verse 7 Hence existence, for example, proof on the basis of existence, and regulating creation, for example, proof on the basis of providence, are both rational evidences to the presence of an originator. 5. Why couldn't the human beings and other living organisms have all originated from other simple primates? There are two illogicalities here. First, there is not one single evidence proving a major evolutionary development. By evolutionary development, we mean the transition of one species into another form of species. Scientists have never been able to verify or spot a single evidence on a transition from species to another, and all of these are just mere speculations. So, how can an atheist choose to believe in a speculative evidence and deny our religion-based solid evidence? Second, according to the minimum gene set concept, no living organism, no matter how primary, can go below 200 genes. Nature magazine stated in their issue dated 6 January 2006 that we could never go below the border of 397 genes. Energy production alone requires at least six genes, and if one single gene is missing, the cell will not be able to provide any energy. Likewise, each and every basic function requires a minimum number of genes. Scientists have found that mycoplasma is the most accurate living organism on Earth. It has 468 genes, and each one of these genes contains complex proteins that could be within the range of 1,000 to 10,000 amino acids. Hence, if you have three billion specialized pieces of information, these pieces of information are embedded inside the nucleus of each of your cells to produce precise vital functions or even 11,000 pieces of information. Then you are facing a giant treasure of specialized information that has suddenly materialized. 
atheists fantasize that there were beings that emerged from a count of zero genes. But the theory of minimum gene set came to thwart this fantasy. Obviously, all living organisms have emerged so functionally complex from the very first moment. 6. What are examples to the proof of the basis of providence? There are numerous examples, and no volumes can be large enough to contain them all even if they filled the whole planet. Each atom in the universe is actually a proof on the basis of providence, whether we realize this today or will do so tomorrow. A. Insulin, the hormone that allows our bodies to use glucose, is secreted by the pancreas in the exact same amount of sugar we consume. B. The power of our hearts in pumping blood is exactly equal to the energy needed by the muscles when exerting any effort. C. The one-way valve of our stomach prevents the influx of digested food that would otherwise harm us. D. The sphincter muscles located at the gates of our orifices, without which our clothes would have been soiled the whole time. E. The skull bones that are left unfused at birth, so the baby can easily cover the journey through the birth canal without breaking its head. Had these bones been fused, the baby would have never been able to cover this journey, except if its skull got broken. These bones stay unfused till the brain is fully developed. F. All the axes of your nerves that convey the electrical signals are covered with a dielectric layer, as we do with electrical wires, so that the electric signals do not get lost or disturb us. G. The electron revolves around the nucleus at a speed of 1,000 kilometers per second, or otherwise, it would collapse inside the nucleus by the force of attraction of the positive nucleus, and the universe would have collapsed before it even began. So, this is the ideal speed for forming the atom. H. When two atoms of hydrogen combine, 0.7% of the hydrogen mass turns into energy. If this mass was 0.6% instead of 0.7%, the proton would have not combined with the neutrons, and the universe would have remained in the form of hydrogen, and none of the other elements would have been formed. If the mass converted to energy was 0.8% instead of 0.7%, the fusion would have been too fast, which would have led to the disappearance of hydrogen immediately from the universe, making life impossible. That's why this figure had to be between 0.6% and 0.8%. I. The electron mass constitutes 0.2% of the neutron mass, and this mass is ideal for forming the atom. J. After germination, the buds tend to go up directly to the light source, whereas the roots tend to go down because the buds are highly sensitive to light. All the information they need to function is encoded within the seed, and there are hormones that control the upper and lateral growth of the plant, as well as the growth toward the roots, all of which is encoded within the seed. You eat the delicious fruit and throw the dry and tasteless pit away. This way, you are compelled by a controller who governs the whole universe, allowing that fruit to pass its genes all over the earth giving you the savory taste while hiding the genes in the core of a smooth, dry pit that is not attractive to you. Once the seeds stick to the ground, it starts quietly transforming into branches and roots, and this is how the mother succeeds in passing her genes on to its children. All of this takes place in a plant that has no cognition. So, who adjusted the information for those deaf-mute fruits? And who adjusted the amount of sugar so it would appeal to your palate? Who made the seed unappealing so you could dispense with it and throw it away? Who loaded the seed with sufficient genetic information to create a new plant with all its details and functions? K. Lately the scientists have been discussing the total mass of the universe and how it is essential for our existence on Earth. Inertia this blessing which is given to our bodies in the form of resistance to any change in movement originates from the mass of the universe.
Had the inertia been any less than what it is, any soft breeze of wind would have been able to move the rocks, which would not have been able to resist the least amount of effort exerted on them. In a universe like ours, we would have been bombarded by all sorts of flying bodies. If the inertia was more than what it is, we would have found a great difficulty in moving our fingers, if we even managed to move them, and controlling them would have been an improbability. This means we would have been unable to move or do any tangible effort of any kind. The first man created would have not left his spot. That's why it is particularly interesting that the inertia of any matter had to be identically what it is right now. The thing that baffled the physicists here, as we see in the book, Unity of the Universe by Dennis William Skiyama, is that of this inertia, the whole of the Milky Way galaxy only contributes one ten millionth, the Sun contributes one hundred millionth, and the Earth itself contributes one thousand millionth. This leads us to realize that this ideal inertia we live on, and which allows us to partake on all our activities, is the overall value of the whole universe. Consequently, we can particularly say that our existence depends precisely on the mass of the whole universe and its very existence. Allah says what means, We did not create heaven and earth, and all that is between them in vain. That is the opinion of those who deny the truth. Woe betide those who deny the truth, when they are cast into the fire. Translation of the Meaning of the Quran, Chapter 38, Verse 27 The more we ponder and look, the more we realize the marvels, the wisdom, and the intricacies of this creation. 7. Some atheists try to debunk the proof on basis of providence by bringing into focus some imperfections like illnesses and earthquakes, for instance. The presence of imperfections, if indeed we do accept this description, does not in any way deny the perfections. As a matter of fact, it only proves that perfection does exist in the universe. Had there been no perfection in the first place, the atheist would have never been able to identify the imperfection. How can someone identify an imperfection in the design if there was no design to start with? As for their description itself, what they call imperfection is actually an imperfection in their ability to grasp the wisdom beyond all things. The believer never claims that the universe is perfect and without calamities. He only claims that the essence of perfection is that nothing happens without a purpose. Atheists are like someone denying the mastery of a spaceship just because it has a big amount of fuel that could explode any time. The universe was never designed to be perpetual, and we were never designed to be gods. As a matter of fact, we were designed to be tested with both good and evil. Allah says what means, we test you with both good and evil circumstances as a trial. To us, you shall return. Translation of the Meaning of the Quran, Chapter 21, Verse 35 All of this takes place within the scope of a higher purpose and wisdom. 8. It is a given that Allah does not need us, so why did He create us? The very notion that need corresponds to futility is absurd. Need corresponds to wisdom not to futility. The wealthy and famous physician might choose to treat people without needing anything from them. He treats them only for their own good, and we can never describe his action as futile. The wisdom and the higher purpose beyond it do not revolve in a vicious cycle of need and futility. A swimmer might rescue a child out of mercy, and then he leaves him and goes without wanting for any word of thanks or gratitude. We can never describe this as futile, because it can only be described as magnanimity and superior manners. Hence, there is no concurrence between need and futility. We have this divine narration in the book of Sahih Muslim. O oh, my servants, were the first of you and the last of you, the human of you and the jinn of you, to become as pious as the most pious heart of any one of you, that would not increase my kingdom in anything. If they were to rise up in one place and make a request of me, and were I to give every one what he requested, that would not decrease what I have any more 
than a needle would decrease the sea when you dip it in it. So Allah has no need for all the worlds and whatever effort we exert, whatever work we do or whatever goals we pursue, we are the only ones who benefit. Allah says what means, and whoever strives, strives only for himself. Allah is independent of all his creation. Translation of the Meaning of the Quran, Chapter 29, Verse 6 If the patient is ignorant of the doctor's wisdom, this does not mean that the doctor's decisions are purposeless. Also, acknowledging the wisdom does not necessitate comprehending its full scope. Understanding part of it suffices. It is enough to know that we are assigned with certain responsibilities, and enough to know what these responsibilities are, and that there is a wisdom beyond all this. Otherwise, we will be like those who denied that which they do not comprehend. Indeed, they are denying something which they cannot comprehend, the reality not yet having dawned on them. Translation of the Meaning of the Quran, Chapter 10, Verse 39 Hence Allah is wise, and He created us for wisdom. 9. In the deductive argument for the existence of a Creator, do we draw on evidences from our human experience? The evidence of creation is based on an inference of empirical evidence and a definite knowledge emanating from necessary premises. The Quran, in its deductive argument for the existence of a Creator, does not follow the path of inference by analogy. As for deductive analogy, it proves the meanings and then extracts the rulings, whereas the deductive argument for the existence of a Creator depends on direct deliberation and observational significance. Allah says what means, Were they created out of nothing, or are they their own creators? Translation of the Meaning of the Quran, Chapter 52, Verse 35 Here the verse limits existence in three possibilities. One. Either they came out of nothing, and this is impossible, since nothingness cannot bring anything since it is already non-existent. Two, or they created themselves, and this too is impossible, since it is an evident absurdity. Three, or they have a creator who created them. This is an initial rational reasoning, not an analogy, so we could say that it is based on mere human experience. This does not in any way mean that we censure human experience, since all sciences are based on human experience. When we say that the universe exists and that it is not self-subsistent, then it must have a creator, and that everything in the universe came with notable physical constants and precision. Then there has to be a creator and a maker. We are actually using direct preliminary premises, not rational analogies or human experiences. Causality, as one of our evidence of the Almighty Creator, does not depend on intellect and extrapolation. It is rather a rational principle based on the basic psychological necessities. 10. Why can't we see that there is a material reason for the creation of the universe? For example, another civilization or something else, why stick to the eternal deity specifically? There is a rule that was established by the Islamic scholars since more than a thousand years ago. This rule states that having a series of actors consequently leads to non-action. Having a series of actors means the presence of more than a creator. This supposition assumes that we have another civilization, and a civilization that preceded it and produced it, and a civilization that preceded the first one and produced it, and so on. So, there is a series of creators, and this series leads necessarily to non-action. Non-action means lack of any creation like the universe, mankind, and so forth. Hence, the sequence of actors leads to lack of emergence of any universe into existence. If one of the civilizations depended on the emergence of another, which has formed it, and this first civilization also depended on another to form it, we will just keep going to infinity from one civilization to the one that preceded it without reaching an end. Consequently, there has to be a first creator that started everything with the first action. To make this a bit simpler, let us imagine we have some domino pieces arranged one after another. So if one falls, the whole stack will fall. 
If we assume that a particular piece will not fall until the one before it falls, and that the one before it will not fall until the one before it falls, and so on, then no piece will fall unless the sequence of pieces have a beginning to start with. If the pieces go on to infinity, then no piece will ever fall. Hence, if the sequence was infinite, no creation would be there, since the doer's existence will depend on another and so forth. Which takes us to our first argument. Had the sequence been infinite, there would have been no creation, no action, and no existence. There has to be a beginning, a start for the creation, and hence a first creator. So, anything accidental that needs an instigator must necessarily have an originator. And if we say that there is a need for an instigator, then none of this could have emerged unless the long sequence of events had a very beginning. This is why we assert that there is a first creator before whom nothing else ever existed. 11. We know the laws that govern the universe, and we know what causes the volcanoes, so why do we need a creator if we know all the laws? Atheists assume that the laws are in themselves enough for creating and originating the universe. Stephen Hawking used this premise and theorized that the law of gravity is in itself enough for creating the universe, as he explained in his book, The Grand Design. Hawking's report went viral over the world news, and all the media and popular websites shared it. Regardless of the fact that this assumption foils automatically when attempting to know the source of the law of gravity, or who enacted it, or gave it this invasive and effective ability, Regardless of all the initial axioms, the law of gravity alone does not cause the billiard ball to roll. The law by itself is incapable of doing anything without the emergence of things. The law of gravity does not produce a billiard ball. It can only move it once it emerges and once it is hit by the billiard stick. The law of gravity is not a standalone thing. It only describes a natural event. The law of gravity does not move the billiard ball without thrusting the stick in the ball's direction to move it. Only then can the ball roll, and only then can the effect of the law of gravity materialize. Yet the atheist assumes that the existence of this law is enough to create the billiard ball, the billiard stick, and to roll the ball. So what is it that comes easier to the mind and sound reasoning? Faith or atheism? Likewise, the laws of internal combustion of the car motor will not create a car motor. Even if we added the laws of internal combustion to the car motor, this will not be enough to make the motor function, since we still need fuel to provide energy. We still need a spark to set the combustion in action, and before all that, we surely need a motor. Only then will the laws of internal combustion function. But it would be irrational to think that the laws of internal combustion are enough for creating a motor, a spark, fuel, a driver, and a road. This very assumption could take us once again to the sequence of actors which we spoke about in the previous question. 12. Why can't this whole universe be the resultant of mere chance? This very assumption reveals ignorance of the fundamentals of probability because a chance requires two intrinsic conditions, time and space. Chance requires a time for its occurrence to have effect. It also requires a physical space where it can take and produce its effect. So how can we say that chance had a role in originating the universe despite the fact that our universe originated from no time and no space? How can the effect of the chance be evident without the origination of the chance itself? How can the chance give effect before it is there and before the existence of time and space, which are both intrinsic conditions for its presence? 13. What do we say to the atheist who argues that the universe has developed? Science does not cooperate the tendency of the universe from simplicity to complexity. On the contrary, science corroborates the transition of the universe from full complexity to simplicity throughout time. This is the law known as the second law of thermodynamics, and to make it a bit simpler, let me tell